David Haydu has written two previous works of authoritative and lively cultural history. One was Lush Life, a biography of the musician Billy Strayhorn. The other was Positively Fourth Street, about the folk scene in the village way back when. His new book, The Ten Cent Plague, is about comic books and America's moralistic campaign to censor them in the 1950s. Mary Roach is the author of Stiff, a successful and often hilarious book about human cadavers, and of Spook, about our efforts to investigate the afterlife. Her new book, Bonk, is a history of sexual research. It has a laugh, an amazing fact, and three blushes per page. Lewis Major has written previously about baseball's first World Series, the year 1931 with its clouds gathering over the issue of slavery, and also capital punishment in the early years of the United States. His brand new book, The Soiling of Old Glory, examines a famous photograph of anti-busing violence in Boston in 1976. David Gilmore, a Canadian novelist and movie critic, has written a moving and distinctive memoir called The Film Club. It's about a deal he made with his son. The boy, Jesse, a teenager, was allowed to drop out of school if he would watch three movies a week with his father. With a nod to Joseph Conrad, Marlon Brando, and the sometimes taboo subjects of these books, the title page of this episode reads, The Horror, The Horror. Three, two, David Haydu, welcome to Title Page. Thanks. Your, your book, The Ten Cent Plague, The Great Comic Book Scare and How It Changed America. Can you tell us what the plague was and how it changed America? Sure. Well, the, the word plague has two meanings in the book. Uh, w one meaning is uh, the way that the, col the, the conservative culture of the late 1940s and 1950s saw comic books. They saw them to be as, uh, this this viral contagion that was infecting the country, affecting young people, and corrupting young minds. Um, the other meaning of the word plague is that for the people who made those comics, who were outsiders of all sorts, uh, uh, women African Americans, uh, members of minorities, uh, Jews, Italians, who, who saw comics as an outlet of expression, uh, and a, a way to express the pride in outsider status, for those people, when, uh, the, the, when the conservative culture clamped down on comics, tried to snuff comics out and kill the medium, uh, the effect was like a plague for them. And in the end of the 19, early 1950s, more than 800 people who had been makers of comics, artists and writers, found themselves out of work. I noticed that you listed the names of those people in, mm -hmm. the, in the back of the book. I did. The, the, the appendix to the book is like a war memorial. It's a list of the names of everyone who, um, who, were, who, who made comics and many people who were drawn to the medium uh, because they, they, they loved it and they felt that in comics uh, they could express a sentiment, a sensibility that wasn't welcome elsewhere. And they felt that uh, comics was a place where they were welcome, when, when they might not have been welcome in uh, conventional, traditional book publishing or in magazines or in fine art, they felt they were welcome in comics and, uh, and, and uh, their, their art form was almost killed. So it's like a war memorial. The, so, the, book, the book is in a way a war story. In a way it's the story of a birth of an art form. The f first half of the book is about the creation of this vernacular homegrown art form that kind of runs wild and, uh, in the absence of cultural oversight. And uh, when the cultural overseers catch wind of what's going on in those lurid four-color pages and clamp down on comics, a battle ensues. And the second half of the book is kind of a, a war story. The, you say that it was the comic books were the most popular mm -hmm. form <clears throat> and most uh, widely available form of popular mm -hmm. entertainment. How do you figure that in comparison, say, to the movies? It's hard to believe today. It's, when, when, when you think of something like that, uh, it's really a head-scratcher to imagine. But uh, the raw numbers are 
that comic books sold between 80 and 100 million copies every week in the late <laughs> 1940s. 80 to 100 <laughs> wow. million every week. Uh, many more people of all ages, and not just young people, but mostly young people uh, were reading comics, and more people were reading comics than were going to the movies. Certainly were watching television because television was new. Certainly more than were watching radio because radio was in decline. And certainly more than were reading conventional books or magazines. Uh, and uh, it, comics at that point were read by everybody, uh, not just... We, when we think of comics today, we think of fans, uh, and we think of a subculture of uh, zealots who buy them and keep them in protective sleeves and might not even read them. But uh, in those days, in the late 1940s and 50s, comic books were popular culture. Mm -hmm. And everybody read them. The, the, um, you also make a very interesting case in the book that comic books in some ways had to do with the immigrant experience mm -hmm. in America. And how, how did that work? Why were they an expression of, mm -hmm. of immigrant mm -hmm. um, sensibility? Well, I, I, I interviewed about 150 people and tried to find as many of the first-hand witnesses of the events that I could find. Uh, and they described their experience to me and told me about the experience of their peers. Uh, most of the people who I found were first-generation immigrants, and um, many, a great many Jews and uh, Italians, uh, refugees and immigrants from Eastern Europe, great many more uh, women than one would assume, uh, Japanese Americans, uh, African Americans, and other members of um, minority groups uh, who were not blessed with the opportunity to have high education and weren't exposed to fine art the way that others were exposed to um, and didn't have access to not only education but to the professional realms that other people might have had access to. So they right. felt that gr comics were a place where they, where they felt at home. And once they were there, working in comics, kind of creating this art form on the fly, they used it to express not only their outsider status, but a pride in their outsider status. And the comic books in the late 1940s and early 50s are full of, you know, coded expressions of pride and outsider status, of you know, aliens and monsters of, of all sorts who were misunderstood because they were different, you know. Uh, miniature people from alien races who uh, were underappreciated because they were small, <laughs> because they were a little diminutive, it because seems, they were freakish. It seems to me Plastic Man, <clears throat> in a way, which is one of my favorite mm -hmm. comics, is an expression of mm -hmm. the malleability and changeability of people and the way one has to adapt to mm -hmm. environment. It's one of the things that occurred mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects mm -hmm. of the objection to comics mm -hmm. was its sexual, mm -hmm. uh, was its extreme mm -hmm. sexual nature. We have with us uh, today Mary Roach, who's written a book called Bonk about the history <laughs> of, <laughs> you like that segue, huh? Um, <laughs> the, the nice hit, one. <laughs> The history of um, scientific research into human sexuality, basically. Um, what were the four most amazing, or you could do three, most amazing things that you learned when you were writing and researching this book? Well, I'm going to give you a little, I'm going to give you a sampler from the very trivial, uh, which was, okay, um, that women have nocturnal erections. Okay, surprise um, for me. Anyway, uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the biggest surprise, I guess, in a broader. It's pretty surprising. Well, you wanted a surprise. <laughs> uh, well, okay. something to it. think about. <laughs> uh, but I guess, uh, speaking on a broader and uh, um, less um, explicit level, I think uh, just the, the extent to which we we still don't understand physiologically what happens when when people have sex and have uh, orgasms and and for, for example there's this this issue this has gone on for for hundreds of years um, this question of whether uh, orgasm increases a woman's odds of conception and uh, this goes way back to you know the Habsburg Empire and the Princess Maria Theresa who's whose physician uh, recommended she was having trouble conceiving then and her physician recommended that uh, uh, I believe it was phrased uh, I am of the opinion that the vulva of Her Most Sacred Majesty should be titillated for some time before intercourse. 
<laughs> because it was believed that uh, for, wait, you know, for hundreds of years that uh, a, a woman couldn't conceive unless she, uh, had a, a, she too had this climactic experience. Uh, and so this, and, and the research, it is still, it's still a, a, an open question. I, mean. thought, I thought actually, as I recall, that you kind of closed the question. That well, the answer... the, the, yeah, well, Masters and Johnson did this amazing study where they, they, brought, they, they had women come in and they fitted them with a, a, a cervical cap containing uh, dummy semen. And then they had them. <laughs> what, is there such a thing as smart semen? <laughs> okay, erzatz. <laughs> erzatz semen. semen. Okay. And and then had them um, masturbate. And then they and they were radiopaque dye in this dummy semen to see then you know was it being taken up? Yeah. And and it, there was no evidence of it. But they've been criticized by saying you know that with a cap fitted over the cervix there could be no suction. And uh, um, there is in the animal kingdom there is uh, evidence to the. To the contrary, in, in Denmark, they actually recommend the artificial inseminators uh, stimulate the sow beforehand because if the, if the sow is pleased, then there's a 6% increase in farrowing rates in the so, number of piglets. So it is actually an open, it is still a bit of an there, open question. Are there job positions available for sow <laughs> masturbators in, in Denmark? No, but there is actually a sow vibrator. It's called the reflexator. I was going to ask you um, about that. There are a lot, I'm not about the reflexator or where to get one unnecessarily, but um, about um, the patents and the devices that yes. you've come across in doing your research to assist people in various regards. Yes, what, what are yes. some of those? There, there are, well, there, there was a huge market for a while in uh, anti-masturbation devices because it was believed that um, if you were spilling your seed, that you were wasting it, you were, that it was bad for the health and it would cause impotence among every, senility, warts. I mean, everything was attributed to masturbation for a while. Uh, and there were these just elaborate, like, whole suits, you know, that would, that would lock in key mechanisms to keep you from touching yourself. Um, pe the penile pricking ring was particularly ingenious, very simple, mechanical, this was in the, during the machine age. Couldn't where, they have called it something else besides a penile pricking <laughs> machine? But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, usually these, these titles were more euphemistic. There'd be sometimes there's one that was called a boon for men. Right. Maybe. This is the patent <laughs> application. This is the, the title. Yeah. Um, the, um, there's, there's a quote here on near the beginning of the book, page 15. Um, let me just read a couple of uh, sentences and then um, ask you. Uh, a question. Uh, it says, people who write popular books about sex endure a milder, if no less inevitable, scrutiny than those who were sexual researchers. My first book was about human cadavers, and as a result, people assume that I'm obsessed with death. Now that I have written books about both sex and death, God only knows what the word on the street is. Um, first of all, what was the reputation of Kinsey and Masters and Johnson? And do you think they were voyeurs? Uh, Kinsey, had, Kinsey ran into some difficulty because some of his books made reference to uh, children's sexual responses. And he interviewed pedophiles. Mm -hmm. And he, so he, he was brought under scrutiny mainly for that. Um, he himself had a, a masochistic streak, um, which you will learn if you read his biographies. And I won't go into the details and you'll thank me. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, he was, he, he, he was definitely viewed as, uh, he, there was a, his, the publication of his book was, was uh, greeted with some outrage, partly because of, partly because of the, the, um, talking so much about female sexuality and, and women having orgasms and, and you know, women talking. It's just it's the frankness of, of, of female sexuality, which was, which was new at the mm -hmm. time. Masters and Johnson uh, actually hired extra secretaries to deal with the hate mail. Um, it was uh, unbelievable, which surprises me because if you, Human Sexual Response, which is it's, it's, it's a blockbuster book, but it, it's almost unreadable because it is so couched in this, this language of science. Clinical. Clinical, very clinical. Uh, it, no one has trouble getting it up. They have a failure of erective performance. Pornography is stimulative literature. I mean, it's, it's, it's six words where one will do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's an extraordinary book, and it was extraordinary what they did. I mean, 700 people coming into a lab and you know, having sexual responses in, you know, under scrutiny. And uh, not, it was- Not to be rude, but you were one of them recently. Yes, I, it's I, in the book. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it if it if it weren't the case. Yeah. yeah I, I. Yes. I, I. I made my contribution, and my poor husband. I dragged. 
<laughs> him along as well. Um, I'm sure he's glad that he was there. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Um, you know, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. It was, uh, am I taking up too much no, time? No, no, yeah. no. I think, I mean, <laughs> no, we got like Because we can, we can cut to David if you want. Everyone's, <laughs> we like we're, yeah. we're like the sounds. We've been stimulated. You need to, you need to keep going. Yeah, well, okay. This was, uh, I came across this, uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman, a Dr. Jing Deng, who's in London, and he uh, pioneered uh, um, this uh, technique for uh, ultrasound, you know, ultrasound, which is you put sure. the wand on the woman's belly and you, you look at the fetus. And so this is, this is film, moving picture, it's right up your alley, yeah. moving, ultrasound film, three-dimensional. And he pioneered this technique. It's been used, for example, on, on uh, the Lancet had a, a, some stills of his image, somebody like puckering their lips. And you, if you were a surgeon that, say, operated on cleft palates, you could then see sort of the musculature and everything. So it is a useful technique. And he announced in one of his uh, articles that he had done a study of uh, a penis erecting, and there was footage of that. And he said, in my next study, I'm going to bring, actually bring in a couple and do an ultrasound film, 3D, uh, moving picture of uh, coitus. That's so why I emailed this guy and said, can I come to the lab and you know observe or somehow be there on this historic occasion? And he said, well, actually, they're having difficulty getting. Brave couple for intimate <laughs> session is how he put it. Um, he said, if you'd like to come and volunteer, you know someone. And believe me, I tried to get anybody else to do it. I pressured my editor. She pressured the editorial assistants. Yeah. It's very bra It's a very brave passage, and I won't require you to go further with okay. it. We can, we can read about it. <laughs> in the book. It's interesting that all four <laughs> books I'm now beginning to realize as we speak, uh, which I didn't know before, but I knew there was some, I mean, I know there are a number of things in common, but children um, are involved. Protection, sexual protection of children, they shouldn't know things, and mm -hmm. in the comic book plague, mm -hmm. and you watching with your son, David mm -hmm. Gilmore watching with his son. And even in The Soiling of Old Glory, um, uh, Lewis Major has written a book about, it suddenly dawned on me, the busing of children. So um, tell us a little bit about this amazing image that you've written a, a book about and sort of deconstructed what was in it and what it meant and what it did and who the people are. I was wondering how you're going to segue from <laughs> sex to this photograph. You did it brilliantly. I'm thinking in my mind violence, maybe sex and violence. These are the ways to that, do it. That was one of the possible names for this episode. Yeah, thank you. It, 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 it's, it's a photograph, one of those iconic images that come to define an era. It was taken by Stanley Foreman at an anti-busing rally in Boston in 1976. This is the height of the busing crisis in which students from Roxbury and South Boston were supposed to be cross bus to achieve the goal of desegregation of the Boston schools, which were found by federal courts uh, to be in violation of the law. Uh, yeah, so these are teenagers. These are high school kids who felt caught up in this battle that was larger than them and bigger than them in all kinds of ways, and, and we can talk more about the sort of effect of that. Uh, on this day in April, Foreman is late arriving at the scene and he manages to get off a few shots, and one of these shots he realizes later in the darkroom is this stunning image of, uh, of a youth uh, using the American flag seemingly to try and attack a black man in the scene who's being pummeled or punched or held. Uh, the image appears on the front page of the Boston Herald American, it appears in the New York Times, the Washington Globe is picked up around the world and becomes again one of those those frozen moments in time mm. that come to define the era in many ways. Mm. What happened to the three principles involved? The photographer, the victim, mm. and the assailant? Well, the photographer, Stanley Foreman, uh, goes on to win the Pulitzer Prize for this photograph. And in an amazing stretch, it is actually the second Pulitzer Prize that he wins. He wins back-to-back -back Pulitzer Prizes with Spot News Photography. Uh, for those who said that he was lucky, uh, he often talks about that notion of luck being the residue of hard work. I think the, that was Vince Lombardi. That's right. I think Vince, that's right. Well, luck is the residue of skill. That's right. Well, and, and Stanley, um, no one works harder. He, um, after the Boston Herald American folded, he had opportunities to work for other papers. He actually then went into uh, video camera work and is still to this day a video cameraman for a local television station in Boston. The man being attacked is named Ted Landsmark. Uh, he's currently the president of, uh, the, um, of an architectural college in, in Boston. He was 
A.B. J.D. Yale. And when this man was attacked, uh, his attackers attacked the wrong possible person. He was a civil rights activist in the 60s. Uh, he was with the Freedom Riders. He followed King. He wrote for the Yale Daily News. Uh, he was working for the Contractors Association, trying to get jobs for minorities in the city when he's attacked. So when he comes out of this, he holds a press conference and he knows precisely how to use the occasion to try and bring light to the variety of problems that were afflicting Boston at the time. Uh, the biggest issue is, is the guy with the flag, and if I could just very quickly Joseph tell you the story. We, I was talking to David earlier about this, about the sort of differences between journalists and historians. And, and for <coughs> me, this is my first book in which I actually had to talk to people. As a way in which you've done two earlier works of history, I, I believe. Right, but fortunately, you know, my sources were all dead and on the page, <laughs> and, and I couldn't call them up to speak to them about those events. Uh, I, I knew I wanted to that I would have to contact the guy with the flag. Uh, I wasn't sure if he would speak to me. He'd only spoken to one person that I knew of in the, in the 30 years since. Uh, one of the advantages, perhaps, of the internet is these days with a name, you, know, you could pretty much locate anyone, and I was able to get information. Uh, a journalist would have called, I wrote a letter, <laughs> thinking that I had more control over what I wanted to say to try and get him to talk. Uh, I gave him my cell phone number, and one day I'm driving in the car, my phone rings, and a voice on the other end says, this is Joseph Rakes, the name of the youth with the flag. And we spoke for a long time, and he told me his story. And that's part of what I wanted to do in this book. It's not just that these people's lives are defined by this one 250th second of a moment. How does it play out? How did the photograph define their lives, and how did they then go ahead? and try and give a different kind of meaning, particularly to Ted Landsmark, the victim, and Joe Ra Joseph Rakes, the perpetrator. There's so many um, resonances, as you point out, in the images of the flag, in the almost religious iconography involved of Jesus being pierced in the side. Uh, it's um, in all four of these books, there are so many things to talk about. Unfortunately, we can't talk about all of them, but um, I'm kind of wondering, um, y one of the main points you make in The Soiling of Old Glory is that this was a time when the issue of race seemed possibly to be somewhat behind right. us, right. but this episode... Well, that's what was so shocking about it. I mean, this was Boston. You know, this wasn't Little Rock. And this is 1976, and keep in mind, it's the year of the bicentennial in Boston. And here someone is using the American flag literally in the shadow of the old state house which, by the way, is where the Boston Massacre occurred. And I do this kind of reading of the visual culture of the moment, where if you put Paul Revere's engraving of the Boston Massacre side by side with this image, there are these uncanny kinds of parallels. And in fact, just to interrupt yeah. for one yeah. second, the, the, the series, the HBO series on John Adams, even to this very moment, once again recreates some of the incidents that are historically Proceeding to this one. Exactly, and, and many people talk about the fact that Crispus Attucks, this, this name that is lost in mainstream history but shouldn't be, the, the first, uh, one of the victims of the Boston Massacre, massacre was a black sailor and a freeman. And, and in fact, Landsmark gets compared to Crispus Attucks. So it brings race back, and of course, we were talking, you know, race uh, never goes away. We just like to believe it goes away, and it comes back at different times and in different issues. But it, it, at following the accomplishments of the civil rights era to have this incident in Boston in the year of the bicentennial uh, just, you know, absolutely was, was devastating. And indeed, Boston continues to live as a city under this kind of shadow reputation of being a racist city. When Deval Patrick uh, was elected governor, black governor of, of Massachusetts, one of the first things the Boston Globe said in an editorial was, at last we can put behind us this horrific image mm. by which we have been mm. defined. But mm. just as Boston can't put that behind us, I don't think the nation no, can put we, it behind we, we see either. it now, as we were discussing before, we see it now with the race uh, raising its ugly head in the Barack Obama campaign. Precisely. Uh, exactly. With the preacher who um, is now controversial. Um, David Gilmore, um, <laughs> this, this... Let's see how you're going to do this. <laughs> well, it's actually very easy because it's about education. Yes. And we were just talking uh, about Lou's book about the integration, the force busing, and um, kids who wanted to go to school and couldn't. In your case, um, you had have a son <clears throat> named Jesse who at a certain point in his 
high school career you made a deal with that right. was sort of the end of high school. Right. Well, it was a strange, and I, I was... It was sort of unbusted. It, it, it was an odd thing, you know, it was, it was, I've, I've just published this book now, and, and uh, you know, German publishers have been saying no to my novels for 20 years, one after the other, just no, 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 no. And they bought this one, and I was so intrigued why they would particularly buy this book, because it's no better than anything else I've written. I actually phoned the guy up, and I said, why... Why would you buy this book and not all of the other books that I've written? And he said, well, because, David, first of all, we have sons over here, too. And second of all, the thing you're describing is all over Western Europe. This is just a coincidence. I had no idea. He said, we have smart, um, middle-class boys walking away from our German high schools in droves. It's the same in France, the same in Italy, it's the same in Portugal. I gather it's the same here in the United States as it is in Canada. Initially when this happened to me, when this horror movie happened, because I, you know, I teach literature at the University of Toronto right now. I'm, I've, 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 everyone in my family has gone to university and suddenly I have this tall, beautiful, articulate, friendly, sunny, teenage boy who's, 16, too. who's just a great guy and there's nothing wrong with him. He's not a drug addict, there's no pathology involved. He just will not go to high school and is getting terrible marks. And the problem is, of course, is that it's distorting his personality. It's like trying to put a size 10 foot into a size 6 shoe. The defeat is actually killing him right in front of my eyes. And I couldn't stand it. So I said, look, I'll make you a deal. I can't see this happening to you anymore. You can quit school tomorrow, and I'm not going to substitute one activity you hate with another, so you don't have to get a job. You don't even have to move out, and you can sleep till 5 o'clock every day if you want. But you have to watch three movies with me, and I pick them. Now, that's the deal. Failing that, you can go out and get a nice little job in, you know, in a subway making sandwiches and get yourself a little room someplace. But if you do that, you can live here expense-free. So that, we thought it would last for two or three months and then he just lost interest. It went on for three years, he and I sitting in the living room watching movies together. And of course it three turned out- Three a day? Out, three a week. Three a week. Three a week. And it turned out to be a better experience, even probably for me than it was for him, just to spend time with a teenage boy at a time when normally they're just closing the door on their parents. As this worked and the book explains that it did work for both of you in different ways, what were the turning points? Well, that, that you remember. <laughs> the turning points were when uh, I gave him James Dean's Giant. Mm -hmm. And this was a, it was, it appeared to be a catastrophe for me because I couldn't get any work. I mean, my, my, my the television show I'd worked on didn't renew my contract. My publisher showed me the door. I had all this time on my hands. It seemed like a colossally mismanaged professional career. So I had all this time. And one day, going out to seek a job, I put on James Dean Giant, and I said, watch this. I came home, unsurprisingly, 20 minutes later, and of course, and he was watching some revolting American sitcom. And I said, how did you like the James Dean movie? And he said, I didn't get all the way through it. And I said, look, this is the only education you're getting. This is serious. You do this, or you get a job. And he suddenly understood that I wasn't fooling around, mm. that this wasn't entertainment. And he began to, he suddenly began to take it all seriously. Mm. Now, I, the one thing I want to say is that, you know, he went back to university after this. But I, I want to say that he, he he's out, outraged by the notion that I might be using this book as a kind of, he saw the light and then he was fine and he went to university. His point, he always wants me to illustrate, which is, Dad, I was fine before I went to university. The only time I wasn't fine was when I was in high school. I'm not okay now because I happen to be enrolled in university. And I, I feel compelled to honor his sentiment about that because he's quite right. He was great before. It was high school that was killing him. How did you decide what films to show? I was a, a, a not particularly distinguished film critic <laughs> for 15 years. And I'm not, no, I loathe false modesty, but trust me, I was a, a, a phrase maker as opposed to a thinker. There's a real difference mm -hmm. in the world of filmmaking. We discussed that just a few moments ago. Um, I didn't want to film Weenie. 
In other words, I didn't want some obnoxious 16-year-old who only watched Fellini and only watched Kurosawa films. I wanted him to understand that a junk film like Showgirls was essential to understanding and to loving films. If you were going to like Eight and a Half, you also had to like Basic Instinct. So I picked, I didn't want to make the same mistake that the schools had made, which is kill movies for him, as they'd killed Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Shakespeare. So I made an entertaining package. I gave them something difficult, like Ran, and then I gave him Sharon Stone as dessert. Wow. Nice dessert. <laughs> Did you carve out time to discuss the film? Oh, just absolutely. Watch them oh, no, because this pinball. was what was so lucky. <laughs> this is what was so lucky because I had nothing else to do with my day. Mm -hmm. So what we would do would be watch these films. And then he was a chronic smoker. Naturally, of course he smokes. Right? No one in my family smokes. But we would then go out to the porch and he would talk about the film we just watched. But what was interesting was the film served, if you like, as a kind of trampoline mm -hmm. that we would start with the movie. But very quickly, because he's an articulate and interesting guy, he would talk about girls, boys, drugs, alcohol, this, that. And so that's what gave me the entree into his soul at that time, was just because I was there on the porch. Look, in the end, what this was really about was that the need of a teenage boy to spend time with his father. Right. That's really at the heart of this book. That's we could have been playing, we could have been skydiving together, or we could have been collecting goldfish. The fact is, what he needed and what boys need is they need their fathers. They really do. And that's what became clear to me while we were doing this. I, I, <clears throat> I think what you say is, is all true with a teenage son who loves movies, um, myself. Uh, actually, he's not, no longer a teenager. Time flies. <laughs> but I wonder if it would have been the same with skydiving. Because the second most important theme here is romance. Yes. Not only your sons, but prominently your sons, but your own own marital life and history. <laughs> and these movies yes. address those issues in a way that allow you to talk with yes. him about them. Yes, absolutely. It's true. Uh, uh, can I, you give an example of a movie that was a catalyst for that? Well, what I discovered in the course of w watching these movies was, uh, I mean, I, I learned a whole lot of things, one of which was that I was a film snob and that I watched movies from an ideological position, whereas he had a much cleaner soul and watched movies for their pure narrative. And so I learned from him, actually, to re-watch movies in terms of what's just a watchable movie, why certain movies like Citizen Kane, maybe not, are not maybe as great as we say they are, that these are inherited things. Uh, but one of the things that I learned was watching A Hard Day's Night with him, which was, it sounds reduced, that he's not me. <laughs> and that when I showed him this movie with this panting introduction and then asked him breathlessly at the end, not if it was good, but how sensational was this film, and he said, it's a terrible film, and they're terrible actors, and the worst of them is John Lennon. He's a totally embarrassing man. And I had one of those epiphanies where I suddenly thought, Actually, Hard Day's Night is not a very good film. But most important is, he's not a little version of me waiting to turn into a full-blown me. He's a completely different entity. So that indirectly answers your the, question. The, the, there was, he was at an age where um, he didn't need any longer to be protected from violent images or, I mean, he was old enough, 15, 16 years old. Yeah, he was 16 17. Years old. So that he could watch just about any movie. And I, I talking to you about this puts me back in mind of, of mm -hmm. David's book, mm -hmm. which, in which the censorship mm -hmm. of uh, comic books was mainly mm -hmm. visited upon them mm -hmm. by an older generation, by adults, to right. protect children. Right. What, what was... The issue of violence really wasn't central because comics were the uh, object of attack and scorn by the c prevailing culture f uh, b before comics became violent. Uh, originally they were charged uh, with, uh, con with being bad for the eyesight, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or uh, inducing illiteracy. Uh, then they were considered fascist, and then communist, and then over time, and, um, and then uh, too overly violent and salacious. The real issue, one of the, one of the real issues, and it's not that simple a case really, that's why I took a whole book to, to do it justice, but one of the issues, gets back to David's point, was uh, 
about the issue of the a generation's right to have its own tastes and to have its own identity and to decide for itself and to have it, what, uh, what it liked. <laughs> and and the, in, in the simplest terms, the right to have its own tastes and whether or not those tastes subscribe to the same standards of the uh, previous generation. And the whole issue is, uh, the whole controversy of comics boiled down to the issue of taste and the right of one generation to have taste of its own. Right. So to get but also, right, I, is, I do want to, I, I did want to ask mm -hmm. you, though, do, do you feel like all art forms are of equivalent stature? Mm -hmm. Some of them are lower, as a lower art. Is there not, is there, do you not believe that any art, for, art form is lower than another one that, for example, filmmaking or, or, mm -hmm. or poetry mm -hmm. is on the same level as, as comic books? I was, when I, when I, 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 I don't know that I would impose a hierarchical standard at all. I just don't think that way. But it, what was it, might be case, it might be the case. What was your response to way. reading lots of comic books? I mean, I know that yep. when, when I have an experience of mm -hmm. some forms of culture that I find less agreeable than others, mm -hmm. I have a kind of numbing, mm -hmm. uh, not very agreeable effect. What was your effect about, as, a, as an adult, with mm -hmm. sophisticated tastes, mm -hmm. reading a whole bunch of comic books? You, to, to research the book? Yeah. It was eye-opening. They were much better than I thought. Oh, that's what yeah, I was They were much more artful than I expected them to be. I mean, when I was a kid, I was interested in comics. I wasn't a comic book fan. I, right. you know, I read, uh, you know, in college, I would never look at a comic. Right. You know, I wouldn't, didn't read underground comics. I was, you know, I was a, I was a snob about literature when right. I was an undergraduate. So to, to me, I was stunned by, by the quality of the books. So but I don't think in hierarchical <laughs> terms. Lewis, you, you well, no, I don't, I don't either, and just look at what's happened now with the graphic mm -hmm. novel mm -hmm. or the work of Art Spiegelman or anyone else whose work is considered as high, if you will, as right. any kind of literature. I, I think actually what ties us together, mm -hmm. listening to you talk about mm -hmm. the tastes of a generation, mm -hmm. the only thing that I would add is that these are often in dynamic tension, of course, with an older generation, right? right? There's this right. element of rebellion. There's this right. element mm -hmm. of wanting to stake out one's own territory. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they just, on their own, create their own kind of cultural aesthetic. Right. It's also in part this acting out of rebellion, right. and and hence the censorship, hence the attempt right. to shut it down. It's, it's Rock an and roll, divine, comic right. books. Well, even, uh, even today right. with writing, I mean, I find myself, you know, I, I ask somebody, well, what do you do? Oh, I, I write a blog. I'm a blogger. You know, I'm a writer. And I think, well, well, but but seriously, a blog versus a book. You know, it's, that's not really right. You know, and I realize, yeah. God, you old-fashioned, <laughs> you know, fuddy daddy. I mean, it's right. but, what. You know. But but you you I was going to come back and say that the 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 boundaries do seem to be coming down and the lines begin to blur. You could not have written this book, Bonk, twenty years ago. I don't think, maybe even ten. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But now uh, there does seem to be a new frankness and a non-hierarchical mm -hmm. nature mm -hmm. to aesthetic evaluations. And it seems to me that y your book, although very funny and very conscientious, is also to some extent a product of our time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. And I, I think I, my first book, Stiff, I think that's very much the case. That book could not have come about fi even five years earlier. It was it, it just the, the taboo happened to disintegrate. Uh, you had all of a sudden CSI and you had Six Feet Under and suddenly dead bodies were not taboo. It was okay to show them on television, to talk about them. And Stiff came along at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if it hadn't, then nobody would have felt comfortable taking you know, a book about yeah. cadavers up to the cash register. And I think the same is... There's yeah, no... Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Th it's that's a, very interesting. The discomfort level of actually purchasing a cultural oh, artifact. Oh, you have thought went into the cover of Bond? <laughs> <laughs> it is a research. great cover. Yeah. But what you're also talking about, Mary, when you, when you talk about visually, right, it's this whole mm -hmm. notion of visual culture that also ties together all of yeah. our work in all Absolutely. kinds of ways. And mm -hmm. what do we do in this culture that is increasingly visual, but I would argue isn't visually literate. Mm -hmm. And there's a distinction there. I mean, how do you read images? To what extent do these images play into the kinds of shaping of cultural assumptions? That when you read a comic book, you can't just read it for the content, it's also the way in which that story is visually told. Or what you were saying mm -hmm. about the kind of visual images, if you will, of, uh, of bodies that in some ways allows the kind of mm -hmm. your first book uh, right. stiff to be written. You know you make a case for cropping. Right. And you say that it's a very standard news photography technique Correct. and all newspapers do it. Correct. You then say that it's possible to crop a photograph and maintain the objectivity of the photograph. 
Yeah, I, don't use the, I don't use the word objectivity. You don't? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm very That's careful why I wish I could find the passage. No, no, I'm, I'm very careful. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's this assumption, I mean, and I spoke to journalists about this, that, that cropping is considered, you know, unlike photoshopping, a legitimate technique that brings out the sort of essence of an image without transforming the image. Now, I'm not sure that I completely agree with that. As you know, I do a reading in this photograph where, you know, when you crop something to make it seem more claustrophobic, when you make the sort of dimensions of it appear different, I think you are ultimately changing. But there is this objectivist bias whenever we look, particularly at photographs, right? This idea that it tells us the truth, mm -hmm. that it is reality. Uh, there's a wonderful phrase by another photographer who talks about the devious lie of the snapshot. Mm -hmm. And that's more what I'm sort of interested in proving right. here, uh, that, that this captures a second. And if, if you look at stills versus movies, right, mm -hmm. or, or the sort of sequential lines mm -hmm. of a comic book, they're very different ways of telling the story. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder about the subject of objectivity in, in visual culture and whether what you would say to the proposition that um, we all need to look at a lot of different stuff and read a lot of different stuff in order to, to find our own versions of what's right and what's not? It's complicated because you don't want to go so far as to say that all we live in is a relativistic postmodern world where everyone has their own individual truth. Right? I mean, there are facts, uh, but you know, facts don't speak for themselves, and how you turn facts into truths I think becomes part of the sort of larger enterprise here about what we're all thinking about and talking about. Uh, you know, people engaged in Mary's research, you know, have their own experiences and perceptions. For them, that is reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those kinds of questions, those are the boundaries of questions, the boundaries between fact and fiction, uh, and, and how that stuff gets shaped, how that stuff begins to get, to get understood. You know, photograph is short. It happened. It's a moment. But does it tell the entire truth? And what kind of information do we need in order to be able to read a text fully and completely and understand it? And that gets at some of the stuff here. What's really going on? Is it what we right. think is well, going on? And, and the certainly guy, with film. The guy who seems to be holding the victim, in fact, was trying to help him up. Go ahead, give away the punchline. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's right. There's and, a and, lot and, of good punchlines. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to see banned? In cultural expression, is there anything that you all would like to see not be publicly available? Well, that's a very difficult question. I, I for example, I, and I, I think that pornography bruises the soul. I, I do think that it's bad for your soul. Um, uh, would I call for a ban on it? No, I wouldn't. But I certainly... Um, I have very strong feelings about... I think that people feel art particularly movies, very, very strongly. And that whole ridiculous notion that people had 20 years ago that there's, it's just a film and it doesn't cause... is a ridiculous notion. No, I wouldn't call for the banning, but I, I do kind of want to say that, that, that every so often I, I glance through a, a video store and I find that these things have to bruise the soul and that, without sounding like I'm speaking from a pulpit that no good can come from these things, and I believe that there are that there is a form of art, and that's what I was I talking to you. That way. I, I feel the same way, and I'm troubled by not just the level of violence in contemporary films, but the conception of that violence as play that does have roots in the comic books that I'm talking Precisely. about. That's gone to an extreme, Precisely. and I'm troubled by it. By yes. films like Hostel 2 and yes. all these ultra-violent, sadomasochistic masochistic films, and I think that exposure to that kind of work has inured young people to violence. Yes. And I think that I don't, I, I don't know that there's scientific evidence, but I can't help but wonder if the kind of passive response that young people have had to the atrocities in Iraq and to Abu Ghraib is connected in some way to this kind of feeling that, oh, it's just violence, it's everywhere. And this, yeah, this and, kind and, of, and, and I When I was a small, mm -hmm. when I was a small, a, a ten-year-old mm -hmm. boy, I remember walking down the street and seeing mm -hmm. one man punch another man in the mouth. Mm -hmm. And I remember the blood coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. I remember that mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. I was so horrified mm -hmm. by this act of real violence. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. that my son, because mm -hmm. of his film education, mm -hmm. does not have that response mm -hmm. to real violence mm -hmm. in the world 
at all. I'm talking about another. I know to, go that. To, 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 to go to the point that, that should it be banned? No. But I wish I wish no one would go to see Hostel Two, and I wish yeah. we didn't. As a culture, we didn't have the response that we have right. to it. I'm very troubled by the response. That yeah, we it, have it to raises it. a question yeah. for me about about the ten cent plague, which mm -hmm. is I think near the end. Mm -hmm. Not to put you on the spot. It's what it's, I'm here for. It's <laughs> it's hard to, mm -hmm. to tell exactly what your attitude, I mean for me it's a complex Good. attitude, I Thank won't say you. it's hard to tell, it's a complex <laughs> attitude towards some of these artifacts. Mm -hmm. Is it true to say that mm -hmm. you feel that some of these comic books were indeed deeply objectionable? It's not a subjective book, it's not a memoir, it's not the kind of book that David's done. Uh, my role as a cultural historian here was to do, cast light on the variety of points of view here. Uh, and I hope to do, ju and I hoped and set out to do justice to the variety of points of view. Uh, I don't think that the anti comics crusaders were fully wrong. Right. <laughs> they had, That's what I got. There was an essence of a point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is not unlike what David yeah. just uh -huh. said yeah, about just saying yeah, yeah. maybe fully no. It's not, not that simple. Right. It's, right. That's simple to say, right. oh, they were right, those things, comics should be burned. Right. They were an atrocity. But it's not to bring everything back to sex. No, but, but please, yeah. the, the, <laughs> well, we're talking about sex and death and what yeah, else yeah, is yeah. there really? Sex and violence. Yeah, it's, it was interesting in, in researching the book, I wanted to get access to some of the film that was made in, in Kinsey's attic. Um, Kinsey's best known for his surveys of sexual behavior, which was interviewing, one-on-one -on -one interviewing 18,000 Americans. But he also got interested in the physiology, and he wanted to just document you know, human sexual response. So he, got, he hired a, a filmmaker and they went up to the attic and his people on his staff got together and had sex and there, there are these films that the Kinsey Institute has and I thought, you know, I became very curious. But I wanted to see those. I was like, what is the difference between, between that film and a stag film? Can you see that this is a scientific research project? Is Kinsey there taking notes? <laughs> or is he a voyeur? And there's people who say, you know, he's right. just a voyeur. Right. And it was, it was all uh, business masquerade, right. masquerading as pleasure. You know, or, or, or you know, what exactly was the reality? Well, they didn't. They knew better than to let Mary Roach come. <laughs> <laughs> but Jim, there was something I wanted to mention earlier when you talked about the comfort level would probably not have permitted your book earlier. It, it, uh, years ago, I, I, I interviewed uh, David Cronenberg. He was making the film Dead Ringers at the time, and and he could not find an actor to play this. This, this, this obstetrician, he said that he went to see Al Pacino and he went to see Richard Gere and he said, I could get these guys to play psychopathic murderers mm -hmm. in a second. None of them wanted to play an obstetrician. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, gynecologists used to actually perform their trade uh, looking into a polite middle distance with their hands under the covers, they weren't they weren't allowed to look. This was gynecology and Good. obstetrics. Was... How far we've yeah. how far we've come. Well, I thank you all for joining us. We, we, I wish we had more time. These are endlessly fascinating books, and um, there are a lot more questions that I meant to ask. I do have something to give you that I think is um, uh, relevant to that last question that I asked, and it's a book called Quiet, Please, Dispatches from a Public Librarian. <laughs> and it's a very funny anecdotal book in which um, it is shown that all teenagers know automatically where the dirty books are, the good parts, as we used to say. There's an anecdote about someone who comes in and um, looking for a book by Thomas Pynchon because for some reason he believes that Pynchon is Julia Roberts's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> sure this from, wasn't Pynchon doing that? <laughs> <laughs> That's and, right. We don't see him very much. And, and libraries are mysteriously erotic places, too. Yeah. Especially now that they have the Internet. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. and not so mysterious yeah, anymore. Not so mysterious, yeah. <laughs> The author, Scott Douglas, I wanna, so I'd like to give you this because I think it Thank sort of ob obviously has That's to do with lovely. all of Thank our lives. Thank you very much. That's terrific. Thank and I, I want to thank you all again for, for joining us on Title Page. And I, I want to say to everybody who's watching, and I uh, hope there are many of you, keep reading. Mm -hmm.